this is the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus. He was baptized, and now he's beginning his work of calling and gathering together disciples, and he'll invite those disciples then to carry out his mission. And he continues to do that today. That's why you and I are here. We have been called by him, and we are invited to participate in his mission, in his ministry, in his work. And that's why we gather here together again and again. At the very beginning of this mission, as Jesus begins, we find out that he goes to the area of Zebulon and Naphtali. Now, any time a village or a town is named in a Bible, it's always a good idea to open up your Bible dictionary or go to google.com or Wikipedia and look up that city and find out why is that there? What's important about that? Why does Jesus have to go there to begin? Isaiah the prophet in today's first reading gives us a little clue. Zebulon and Naphtali were two of the twelve tribes of Israel and they were located in the north. And at the time before Isaiah, the Assyrian army came in and wiped them out. They killed many, they took the people who survived, and they took them away into captivity and made them slaves. So as soon as Isaiah prophesied, you, Zebulon and Naphtali, you were wiped out. You are a place of murder, you were put into slavery, To you a light will come, to you the kingdom of God will come and find you. We find that Jesus, as he begins his ministry, decides to go right there. He is a Jewish rabbi. A Jewish rabbi you would expect to turn around and go south and go to Jerusalem, because that's where the temple is. So you would think that Jesus would go there to teach and to preach and to be a good Jewish rabbi. But Jesus is much, much more than a Jewish rabbi. He is God incarnate. So whenever you see Jesus moving around and saying things, you're learning about the heart of God. And what do we learn about the heart of God? God wants to go to Zebulon and Naphtali. God wants to go to those places where there have been danger, violence, where people have been wiped out, where people were pulled away into exile, where people were not allowed to flourish. That's where God's instinct is to go. So it's awful important that right at the beginning, Jesus shows us the heart of God. And that's important because all of us have a Zebulon and a Naphtali in our own life. So in your life, what is a place that has been darkened? What is a place that feels like it's been wiped out? A dream that I had that was just crushed. And now I look and all I see is death and emptiness. I feel like I'm in slavery. If you've ever felt that way, if you have any part of that in your life, the good news is that our God at this very moment is coming to look for you there, to find you there. And then Jesus tells us that when God finds us, God will touch us, God will heal us, and God will show us a better way. So be ready for that. At this moment, Christ is looking for you. A lot of times we think that we have this bad stuff that I've done or this pain that I have or this doubt that I have. And we think that we should leave it at home when we come to church. Because when we come to church, we should be our best. Well, Jesus seems to say the opposite. Why do we come to church? Is because we're broken. Because we've got darkness. Because I've got a place in me that needs to be healed. So I'm going to come here and put myself in a place and bring all of that with me because here is where the Lord is going to find me and literally he's going to touch me. He's going to enter me so he can help to cure me. Now in the gospel we see that same instinct spelled out even more. Jesus is walking along by the Sea of Galilee and he sees these two brothers who are fishermen. Then he sees two other brothers and he calls them to come and follow me. It's not happenstance that Jesus just happens to be going for a walk. The Greek word says that he saw the brothers. We translated it into English as he saw them. The Greek word means he is intensely focused on them. He's studying them. He's watching them with all that he has. Not to try to catch them doing something wrong, but because he's stirred by them. He's interested in them. 
and therefore he's stirred by us and he's interested in us. Our God is looking at your life. Our God is not sitting in heaven far away, unremoved from our life, watching down just to see how's my world doing today. That's not the God of Jesus Christ. Our God is watching you with great focus and intensity. The best way I think it would be would be a parent who's watching their child walk for the first time. Or a parent who watches their child for the first time put themselves in a place where maybe they can get hurt. They could fall down the step or bump that. You watch them with great focus because you want to protect them and teach them a better way. It seems like that's the way God looks at us all the time. And then after Jesus calls them, he says to them, I will make you fishers of men and women. I will make you. The word I will make you is the same word that we have at the beginning of the book of Genesis when creation happened. God decided to make a world. And so every day of the week until the seventh day, God made something else. That's the word that is used here. When Jesus calls the disciple, it's the work of creation still going on. That means that God is not done with the world yet. When God calls you, God wants to make you to be the person that God made you to be. That means that God's not done with you yet. And it's really good news because God's not done with me yet. And I don't know about you, but I know I need a lot of work yet. So thank God that God is still making me and creating me. If God calls you, God's going to help continue to create you. And then I like the idea that after Jesus calls them, what does he ask them to do? He says, follow me. That's it. He doesn't go up to them and say, okay, I got all these great ideas about God and I want to teach them to you so you can learn it. Or I have this great knowledge and these stories and I want you to learn them so that you can go tell them to other people. He simply says, I want you to follow me. And the word to follow means to apprentice, to imitate. So when Jesus calls his disciples, he says, you're my apprentice. I want you to come and do what I do. I want you to imitate me if you're my follower. And then when you do that, you become a friend of God. And it seems to me that maybe that's the point of the spiritual life. For a lot of us, when you talk about spirituality, how's your prayer life? And people will begin to talk about, well, I pray my morning prayer, I pray the rosary, I feel like I should come to the tabernacle, but my journey with God is going okay. Those things are important, but I think maybe the import of the spiritual life is to imitate Jesus, to do what he did, to try to be his apprentice, to really follow him. Our Pope Francis right now is demanding that we do that. You can't just sit down and be a Christian. you got to get up and be like Christ. You follow him in some way. And I like the idea of walking with God. The disciples got to walk with God, talk with God, and be God's friend. Do you remember any place in the Bible where that happened? Go all the way back to the beginning of Genesis. When God created the world, the world was like this Garden of Eden, and then God created us, man and woman, Adam and Eve. And do you remember what happened every evening in the Garden of Eden before the fall? Every evening, God would come into the garden and God would walk and God would talk with Adam and Eve as a friend. That's God's dream. That's the spiritual life. So when you look at this coming week, instead of saying, I've got to get my morning prayer in and I've got to pray my rosary, what difference would it make for you to simply say, I've got to walk with my friend. I want to follow Jesus and I want to learn from him. I want to be his apprentice. I want to learn how to do what he did. And I guarantee you, if you do that, you'll find out why God made you and then God's creation will come to fullness and you'll be wildly joyful because that's God's dream. God simply wants to be your friend. Lastly, in a few minutes, you'll be invited to come forward to receive the Lord, take him with you, and then you walk with him back to your pew. He becomes your friend. All you have to do is be willing to walk with him and to say amen. Can you say amen?